I share the screen. Okay. So welcome everybody to the One World uh, Seminar. Happy and proud to have here today with us Elon Solan from Tel Aviv University, uh, author of the book Game Theory together with Mashter and Zamir, associate editor in, of the International Journal of Game Theory, advisory editor in Games and Economic Behavior, and his main area of interest is stochastic games, quitting games, stopping games, and all sorts of stochastic games. Today is going to talk to us about identifying the deviator and the long stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, indeed, uh, today I'll talk uh, about what does it mean to identify a deviator, how we do it. And this is a joint work with uh, Noga Alon from Tel Aviv uh, and from Princeton, who is uh, here with us, uh, with Benjamin Gandhi, who is a PhD student at Cornell, Xiaoyu uh, He. Uh, who is a postdoc at Princeton, and Ran Shmaya from Stony Brook, who is also with us. Um, yeah, why? Okay. So, no, 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 one second. One second. Okay. So, I will start with the motivating story, uh, which is as follows. So, Alice and Bob. Uh, we would like Alice and Bob to generate a random sequence of bits, zeros and ones. And uh, Alice uh, should generate the odd bits, and Bob should generate the even bits. Now, how do they generate the bits? They are supposed to generate the bits. So Alice is supposed to flip a fair coin in every odd period and to report the outcome of a coin. And similarly, Bob is supposed to flip a fair coin in each, odd, in each even period and report the outcome of his coin. Okay, so Alice in uh, odd, uh, flips uh, her fair coin in odd periods and Bob in even periods. Now, this way, we, ob we obtain an infinite sequence of bits. And, uh, okay, so uh, they were supposed to flip fair coins, but how do we know that they indeed did it and did not deviate? So we decide to uh, have a test, some randomality test. There are many randomality tests. I will not, uh, it's not really important which, which test we, uh, they decide uh, to, uh, to run, so, uh, that I decide to run, but suppose that our test is as follows. So we check whether the long run frequencies of ones is one half. And if the long run frequency is one half, we uh, announce that the sequence is random and otherwise we know it is not random. Okay, so this is our randomality test. Now, suppose that we did this uh, experiment, Alice and Bob flipped the coins, uh, they maybe or maybe not reported truthfully the outcome of their coins, and we got an infinite sequence. And suppose that the realized sequence fails the test. So the long run frequency is not one, one half. Okay, so now uh, with probability one, one of them deviated, at least one of them, who is it? Alice or Bob? So given the infinite sequence of bits, we would like to identify the deviator or deviators. Okay, so in this case, it is pretty easy, right? We look at the long run frequency of ones in Alice's sequence, uh, of uh, the long run frequency of ones in Bob sequence, and whichever differs from one half, we know that with probability one, that player deviates. So, so far, I hope everyone is with me. Suppose that now we decide to run a more elaborate test, randomality test, which is uh, we check for each prefix of this sequence from the first bit to the kth bit. We, uh, we check how we count how many zeros we got and how many ones we got. If this number those two numbers match infinitely often, then we, we proclaim the sequence as a random sequence. 
Okay, so uh, if we think about it, uh, that Alice and Bob essentially control a random walk. Each one is one step to the left, each zero is one step to the right. And we know that in a fair random walk, uh, we return to the origin infinitely often. So we know that we should have infinitely many prefixes in which the number of zeros matches the number of ones. Okay, so we know that with if Alice and Bob both follow the, the procedure we ask them to follow, then we know that uh, the test should be passed. Suppose again that the test, uh, that the sequence fails the test, so that uh, the, the, our random walk returns to the origin only finitely many times. Who among Alice and Bob deviated? Can we look at the sequence, look at the zeros and ones that both generated, and identify the deviator? Now, know that this is not so easy to do. Why? Because, for example, we know that the random walk is, uh, I mean, one could ask, okay, I mean, check whether each one of them, um, uh, the distribution of bits is one half, one half. Will that do? The, uh, the answer is no, because we know that the random walk uh, stays between plus and minus square root of n, which means that if Alice chooses one, slightly more often than zero, one half plus n to the power one third. Then, uh, then uh, the sequence uh, uh, will go to infinity. So uh, there will, uh, we will not, uh, the random walk will converge to infinity, but overall she chooses one half of the times one. So uh, such a, uh, a naive test wouldn't do, wouldn't catch Alice. Also, Alice can just mimic Bob. And uh, I mean, a part of the first bit, she can choose the minus of the bit that Bob chose, the other bit that Bob chose. So if Bob chose one, she chooses zero in the following period. And if Bob chooses zero, she chooses one. So she always cancels out uh, Bob's sequence, so, uh, Bob's, uh, Bob's bit. So we will never uh, get, uh, or if we, the moment we went far away enough from zero, we will never get back to zero. So she's perfectly correlated with Bob, but if you look only on her sequence uh, alone, then it is perfectly random. So it is not easy to, to detect here, a uh, to identify the deviator. So anyway, this is our motivating story. We had a process, flipping a coin, a fair coin, two players, one flips the coin in even periods, the other in odd periods. We have a target set. In our case, the target set was uh, that uh, the random walk returns to the origin infinitely often. Suppose that we did not reach the target set, and we would like to identify that player who deviated. So let's see the formal model. We have a finite set of players. Carl, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question indeed. Um, can you give me some other applications maybe in game theory or is it really only this um, special um, example that you have in mind? I'm thinking okay. about the bigger picture, why I should be interested in this. It's an interesting mathematical problem, but it might not or might um, pertain to game theory. Okay, so uh, so if you, so let me uh, describe the model and then I will talk about uh, applications. So we have a finite set of players, I. Each player has a finite set of actions, AI. So in our case, AI was uh, zero and one, the two, uh, the two bits, and the set of players was Alice and Bob. A is the product of the AIs. This is the set of action profiles. And N is the horizon, which can be either finite or infinite. So we will either study the finite game or the infinite repeated game. So even though I use the, the terminology of games, there is no game here because there is no payoff function. 
what is a goal? So a goal is a pair. It is a strategy profile, sigma star, which in our example was choose uh, each bit with probability one half in every period. And we have a target set B, which is a set of plays. So B is a subset of the set of all plays. And again, A to the power N, this is either the N stage problem or the infinite stage problem, depending on whether N is finite or infinite. Usually we will think of target sets D such that the probability that they are attained under sigma star is either one or close to one, as in our uh, motivating story. A blame function, which is uh, an important uh, concept in this talk, this is a function from the complement of B to the set of players. So if the infinite, the, sorry, if the play, the realized play, finite or infinite, turns out to be not in D, not in the target set, then we would like to point at the, at the player who deviated. This is the F of the play. And we will proclaim the player F of the play as the deviator. And we say that a goal is delta testable for some positive delta if there is a blame function such that no player can, by deviating, can cause us to blame an innocent, can cause us to blame some player who is not him. So, uh, do you see my, uh, my cursor? Okay, so, for, so the goal is delta testable. If for every player I and every strategy of player I, if all other players follow the, the sigma star, their pre-designed procedure, and only player I deviated to sigma I, then the probability that we did not reach our target set. If we reached our target set, we do not care whether you, uh, whether you uh, deviated or not. We all, all care what happens if you, by deviating, you caused us not to reach our target. So the probability that we do not reach our target and we play and we blame a different player than the deviator is small. Okay. So this is a delta testable goal. So one comment is that if a goal is delta testable, then it's prob the probability of D under the honest strategy sigma star is high, at least one minus two delta. Okay. And this is because it follows from the definition of testable, simply plug in instead of sigma i, plug in sigma star of i. So the probability of sigma star under sigma star of the complement of D and we blame we do not blame a long is at most delta. And also the probability that we do not reach D, but we do and we do not blame Galit is at most delta. Since we do not blame I, we do not blame Galit or we do not blame a long. We cannot, okay, we cannot not blame both. So this means that the probability of D is at least one minus two delta. So if an event, if an event D is delta testable, then in particular, its probability, if everyone is honest, is high. Another comment is that if sigma star is pure, is a deterministic strategy that does not use randomization, then it is easy to find a deviator, right? So as soon as the set D, the target set, contains the unique play generated by sigma star, then this this uh, goal is uh, zero testable because any deviation is immediately detected. We know who deviated. 
So this concept of delta nestability is interesting only if our, our uh, strategy profile uses randomization, and then we would like to uh, identify deviations, and uh, it is uh, not clear how to, uh, how to uh, identify deviations uh, when players play randomly. So if a player should play a stationary strategy, and the goal in some way measure, measures, depends on the long run frequencies of, of actions, then we can run statistical tests, standard statistical tests to identify deviations. But in general, if the goal is some strange set, like uh, the set I, uh, in our uh, motivating example, the random walk returns to the origin infinitely often, then it is not clear how to test who deviated. Questions about the model, and then I will answer about applications or some applications. Okay, so uh, with regards to, uh, I'm not an economist, I do not pretend, uh, pretend to be an economist, but if uh, we would like to, uh, to uh, pretend that we are economists, then uh, we can think about, uh, about some, uh, some uh, firm. We have, uh, we have uh, our employees. Each employee has, has his or her task, and they should, uh, should all execute their tasks in order the firm to reach some goal, okay? to, uh, to have our, uh, our uh, new uh, product uh, issued at a certain date. Now, our, uh, the, the, our strategies, the strategies we assign to each player may be random because there is a lot of uncertainty about what will happen in the future. So we do not dictate deterministic strategy for each player, but some random strategy. Suppose we did not reach our goal. The firm did not meet uh, the goal. And then we would like to know who is the cause for, for that so that we can improve uh, our plans for the future. So this is uh, one application, one story you can think of. The other is if you think about uh, repeated gains and you would like to, uh, to construct an equilibrium and the equilibrium is uh, for some reason uh, should be given by a, uh, by a, by a a behavior strategy profile, so not a deterministic one. And this uh, strategy, and suppose that the payoff function is general. It doesn't depend on the long run average frequency of pay of actions, but suppose it is just a general payoff, a general function from infinite plays to payoffs. And we have some strategy profile and we would like to, to uh, construct an equilibrium in which the equilibrium play is to follow this strategy profile. But suppose that someone deviated, we know that someone deviated and then we would like to punish the deviator, but we have to coordinate on whom to punish. So we have to construct some function that tells us given the play, who is the deviator so that we can punish him or her. Okay, so this result can be used to construct equilibria in repeated games with general payoff functions. Okay. So, uh, and this is the, actually the application that called for this example, for this, uh, the study, this project. Okay, uh, it, uh, it originated from the study of equilibria in general repeated games. I have a question about the definition, if I may. Yep. So the goal, it's sigma star and D. So do we require that if sigma star is played, then D is reached, right? What we would it? like D to be reached, yes. But it's not a requirement, so it's not. No, it's not a requirement. We would like to reach D, that the realized play, we would like it to be in D, Mm -hmm. If it is not in D, then we are unhappy and we would like to identify the deviator, or at least we would like to blame someone 
for uh, because of him or her, we did not reach B. But can it theoretically be that in a certain model, the everyone plays according to that sigma star, we still don't reach D? Yes. It seems that in that case, I assume that's not delta testable, so it will not probably be not, not a good uh, yeah. so if example. We, if, yeah, so if we look at the first comment, we see that if the goal is delta testable, then even if everyone is honest, with small probability, we do not reach D. Mm, right, right. So in that case, indeed, we will blame an innocent player. Okay, everyone followed sigma star, yet we did not reach D. Mm -hmm. But this happens with a small probability. Okay, and the second question is just uh, a little uh, clarification. Uh, that sigma star is a strategy in the classical sense. So it's basically that based on all the history till now, each player decides on the next uh, action. Yes, sigma star, this is a, uh, so sigma star of i, the strategy of player i, this is a standard strategy, a function from histories to mixed actions. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's take uh, two examples uh, just to make sure that we, uh, that we follow uh, the definitions. So again, we are back to Alice and Bob. Uh, each one should choose a bit, zero or one. They choose their bits alternately. Again, Alice in even, in odd stages, A1, A2, etc., and Bob in even stages, B1, B2, etc. So B1 is the bit that Bob uh, chooses in the second stage. Now suppose that sigma, the sigma star of Alice is as follows. In round N, she chooses the bit one with probability C over N, where C is some fixed small number. So she chooses one with a low probability that gets lower and lower as the game, uh, the game, uh, goes on. And similarly for Bob, Bob uses the same strategy. So he chooses one in period n, in period actually 2n plus 1, with probability c divided by 2n plus 1. Okay. So you see that since the sum of 1 over n is infinity, each one is supposed to choose one infinitely often, yet the probability that they choose one, one p, uh, in two adjacent stages is of the order of the sum of one over n squared, which is small. Okay, and uh, since c is small, this probability that they choose two adjacent ones is small. Suppose that the set of bad, se bad sequences, and here I define this, the complement of b, the set of bad sequences is all sequences where the, the both players choose one in two adjacent stages, 2n plus one and 2n plus two. So 2n plus one, this is Alice's, Alice chooses one, and immediately after Alice, Bob chooses one. So if both choose one, one after the other, then this sequence is bad. And as I just said, the probability of the complement of D is of the order of C squared, which is small. If C is small, C squared is small. So this is the complement of D. Now, suppose that uh, it happens that the realization is bad. So the bits in st stages 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 2 are equal to 1. Who do we blame? So note that Bob sees Alice's bit. He knows when she chose zero and one. So easily he can frame her, right? He can simply choose as one, one bit after one, once after she chose one. And he can wait one billion stages, choose zero for one billion stages and then choose one and he frames her. Similarly, Alice, all Alice has to do is choose one always. And then eventually Bob will choose one, even if Bob is honest, eventually he will choose one because he chooses one infinitely often. So if Alice always chooses one, eventually 
the uh, Bob will choose one, one stage after him. So both can cause the other one, uh, actually, yeah, both can cause us to reach a bad sequence. And the question is, how do we identify a deviator? So here, the idea is pretty simple, right? I mean, look at how many times Alice chose one. If she chooses one, roughly the, uh, the amount that she was supposed to choose, then pro and, and still the realization is bad, then probably Bob is uh, the one to blame. But if she chose, if Alice chose one too often, then probably she is to blame. And indeed, this, uh, this uh, intuition works in this example. So, and the following is a blame function. So we denote by Kn, this is the summation of all uh, m from one to n. We look at all periods in which a m is one, in which Alice chose one, and we look at this summation, okay? a m divided by two m plus one. So for each period in which Alice chose one, we add one over two m plus one. If this sum is larger than one, then we blame Alice. So if this sum is high, it means that Alice chose one too often, we blame Alice. Otherwise, we blame Bob. It turns out easy probabilistic calculations that this, uh, this is a proper blame function. And now let's look at our random walk example. In the random walk example, now suppose that Alice and Bob choose minus one and one. So either go one step to the right or one step to the left. Again, they choose their uh, numbers minus one or plus one alternately. And D is all the sequences in which the random walk returns to the origin infinitely often. Uh, actually, uh, so uh, if, if we did not, if our sequence, our realized sequence is not in D, then it means that we did not reach the, uh, the, the origin infinitely often. It means that we reached the origin only finitely many times. So we can look at the, at the, uh, at the tail of the sequence after the last time in which, we, in which we reached the origin. So after that, so in that tale, we did not, we never reached the origin. So I rephrased my problem and set D to be all sequences for which there is a non-trivial prefix where, the, where we reached the origin. So the complement of D, the set of bad sequences is all sequences in which we never reach the origin. Our random walk never reaches the origin. So I, is it clear how this, uh, this D relates to the random walk example of, of uh, reaching the origin infinitely often? So reaching, reaching the origin infinitely often is the same as reaching the origin once, okay, for the, for the purpose of testing the deviator. Okay, so I, I hear that I lo lost some of you. So anyway, forget about, uh, about uh, reaching the origin infinitely often. We take the example where we would like to reach the origin once, exactly once. If we reach at least once, we are happy. If we never reach the origin, then the sequence is bad. And then uh, suppose that uh, the players, uh, so the players are supposed to, uh, to, uh, to play half-half, uh, to choose uh, bits minus one or plus one with equal probabilities. Suppose we did not reach the origin, the random walk did not reach the origin ever, never, and we would like to know who deviated. So here, I can also provide you with a blame function. The blame function is much more complex than in the previous, uh, in the previous example, but nevertheless, it can be provided explicitly. 
And uh, okay, so uh, I will not, uh, I will not, I, uh, it is appears here. I will not dwell on it uh, because, okay, it is some uh, blame function. Um, you need uh, a bit of uh, technical probabilistic uh, arguments to show that indeed it works. And I hope that this slide convinces you that it is not a trivial blame function. Question. Um, so, yes. will this will this blame function also work if n is large but not infinite? So, if n is large, you could you could uh, you could uh, think about it here as v is the set of all sequences such that we return to the origin uh, in the uh, until stage one million. Okay. And suppose we didn't reach the origin after 1 million stages, a random walk should return to the origin in the first 1 million period with high probability. Suppose that this did not happen, we would like to identify the deviator. And, and so you can play, uh, I, uh, you can play with this, uh, with this uh, uh, blame function, but also we will see a general proof that we have a blame function. Very nice. Okay. So, uh, can I ask yes. something? Yes. Uh, why, why would I deviate? The deviator gets some payoff no. after the no, the no. There, there are no uh, no payoffs. So why do you deviate? I don't know. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you didn't uh, get the proper instructions, and you didn't follow your sigma star of i just because you didn't get the proper instructions and you would like to know that you didn't get the proper instructions. Okay. okay. But there is no strategic aspects here. Okay. okay. Thank you. As I said, this, uh, this uh, result, this model can be used to prove existence of equilibrium. And then we do have payoffs. But in this model here, we have no payoffs, no strategic considerations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And to um, follow up the previous question, if I may, yeah. can it intuitively, if someone deviates a finite number of times, shall it be like undetectable or something like that, regardless whether it's, it's uh, intentionally or not? The, the question is what is the set D? If the set D, the target set, is not. Um, um, I mean, if it doesn't care about finite many deviations, mm -hmm. then uh, you, you don't care whether you deviated finitely many times because it doesn't matter for reaching the target set. But if, the, if there are two plays that differ only in finitely many actions, one is in D and one is outside D, then yes, we would like to be able to blame someone if we did not reach D. No, but I, I, I understand. I agree. I understand and I agree, but I think just that if, because probabilistically, it seems like a finite number of times, it, it can also be with a reasonable probability, just a probabilistic deviation. So it's hard to, to, to distinguish between such deviations. Yeah, you are absolutely correct, but we allow for a probability of t two delta to make a mistake, right? Yeah. Which is fine. So all this uh, noise goes into the, the two delta, and then I'm allowed to make a mistake even when everyone is honest. Yeah. You should think about it as an epsilon equilibrium. In the concept of epsilon equilibrium, right? We allow for, uh, we punish a player with low probability even though we did not deviate, we followed this strategy, but nevertheless we punish him because we think that he deviated. Mm. Yeah, basically I think that you can defi define a game based on this punishment, based on this uh, uh, function, on this blame function, and then it, indeed it's going to be an epsilon equilibrium. Uh, yeah, so if you uh, do the payoff, if we reach D, the payoff is one, if we do not reach D, the payoff is zero, then indeed 
uh, this is uh, the strategy sigma star is an epsilon equilibrium, a delta equilibrium, yes. Yes. Or two delta equilibrium, that's true. Yes. Okay, so, uh, so this is uh, the second example that we still have uh, on, the, on the screen. It is much more involved, and you could have thought of more involved examples. For example, a two-dimensional random walk. So a two-dimensional, suppose that Alice and Bob control a two-dimensional random walk, each one of them in odd periods and even periods, and we would like the two-dimensional random walk to return to the origin. We know that a fair and two-dimensional random walk returns to the origin infinitely often. So suppose that we didn't. Can we identify the deviator? So I do not have a blame function to give you for that example of a two-dimensional random walk. This is an open problem. Okay. So for some cases, we do have blame functions. For some cases, we do not have an explicit game fun uh, blame function. But nevertheless, what can we say? So I'm going to show you two results. One result is, suppose that the probability of D, if everyone is honest, is high. It is at least one minus epsilon. Then the goal is of the order of square root of epsilon testable. Okay, so, uh, so it is square root of epsilon. We have the square root also of the number of players and a constant of two. Okay, so this is one result. And another, what happens if epsilon is zero? So if the goal, the probability of the goal is one, when everyone is honest, then we can identify deviator, the deviator without making a mistake. So the goal is zero testable. So those are uh, the two results that we have. So essentially, all goals that are achieved, that are, can be attained with high probability are testable. So that's the bottom line. We can test everything. I have a question, how well can you test things? Because I can test also anything if epsilon is one. The, the question is the square root of I epsilon, how good is that? So if, uh, for example, we have two players, right? And suppose that the probability of D, so if the probability of D is one, okay. yeah. then I perfectly, uh, okay. Suppose that the probability of D is 99%, 0.99, so the square root of epsilon is 0.1, right? So what we have here is two times square root of two times 0.1, which is 0 0.4, 0 0.3, about 0 0.3. 0 0.3 testable, so we make a mistake with probability 70%, uh, 30%. If the probability of D is better than 99%, uh, it is 99.99%, then the square root of epsilon is 1%. And then the delta is, is 3% testable. So we make a mistake with probability uh, 3%. Okay? But that I understand. This is, um, these are the formula I was just thinking about. Asking it differently, do you have an example to show that this is in some way tight? So basically, you cannot have it better testable. No. So this is an, uh, an open question whether this uh, figure that we have here is the optimal or not. Whether the square root of epsilon is optimal or not, we do not know that. Uh, hey. Yes, Nova. In the first. Uh... In the first example, you described the square root epsilon is essentially what you get. There is a, the constant is not tight, but the square root epsilon behavior is there. Yeah, this, mm -hmm. yeah, so this is the first example. In the second example, our blame function is worse than square root of epsilon. Right, Noga? 
So we do, we, we do not have a blame function that reaches the square root of epsilon in the second example of random walk. Okay. And we do not know whether square root of epsilon is optimal. Maybe there is a better uh, constant than this, a better uh, ratio than square root of epsilon. Regarding the square root of i, we know how to get it down to the natural log of i, actually log two of i, but whether we can do better than that, we do not know. Okay. So, uh, so this is an, a, a result, it is not necessarily the result, the best result. So, okay, so here we have our, uh, our results. The second uh, thing, yes? Question, uh, how do, uh, does this relate to folk theorems and repeated games? Because theorem two is a bit like uh, if D determines the payoffs, if I have something feasible and I fair the punishment, then you can construct equilibria, no? It looks uh, uh, related to this, no? Yeah, but I do not know uh, whether and how it is related to folk theorems. I don't okay. know. Maybe, maybe, maybe there is a relation. I don't know. Okay. Because P sigma star of D equals one means that it's feasible to be in D somehow and zero testable means you can test. So if you fear to be punished, if you're not, it looks similar, so, no? But. Yes. Okay, this cannot be used to prove like uh, uh, epsilon uh, equilibria infinitely repeated game with more and more stages or the, or the yeah. set of uh, feasible and individually rational payoffs, thing like this. I guess so. I guess it can be used, yeah, to prove uh, if you take uh, the limit of the average payoffs, then we can use this, uh, uh, this result to prove it, uh, existence of equilibrium but we don't need this result, right? I mean, there are easy uh, ways to prove it, but you can use this result. In fact, you can use this result to prove existence of epsilon equilibrium in uh, repeated games with general pair of functions that are tail measurable, okay? Which is more general than the limit of the averages. So you can use this result. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So once we have our main uh, theorems, let's see how we prove it. How we, uh, so, ah, so what I said, theorem two follows from theorem one rather easily. And the, the uh, difficulty there is uh, to prove theorem one. So let's uh, prove theorem one. So what would we like to do? Suppose we are given a play, an infinite play, that is not in D. Now we would like to identify the deviator. So we would like to calculate some likelihood ratio to say what is, whether it is, uh, to look at the actions chosen by player one, the actions chosen by player two, and somehow calculate a likelihood ratio to tell us uh, whether the sequence that Jerome chose, whether it is likely or unlikely to have been uh, to have been chosen given Jerome's strategy sigma star of Jerome. And similarly to look at the sequence of action that Galit chose and to ask whether that sequence of action that Galit chose, whether it is likely or unlikely to occur under sigma star of Galit. The problem is that to calculate a likelihood ratio, we need two hypotheses. We have the sigma star, what Galit should play, and her deviation. But we do not know her deviation. We do not know whether she deviated and we do not know uh, if she deviated to which strategy she deviated. So we cannot calculate a likelihood ratio. So this idea is very nice, but uh, impractical, or at least uh, it is uh, not clear how to use it. And so uh, what we will do is as follows. So for simplicity, I will assume that the horizon is finite. Okay, but this is only for, uh, for simplicity. Uh, the transition from infinite problem to finite problem is not difficult. And we are going to define an auxiliary game, an auxiliary 
two player zero sum game with imperfect monitoring. And actually it is going to be a one shot game. And it will be between a statistician who is uh, supposed to identify the deviator and an adversary who, uh, who is essentially uh, the deviator. Okay, he's uh, nature who chooses to who decide uh, to point at the player who will deviate and to provide that player with a deviating strategy. And the game goes on as follows. First, the adversary selects a player I and a strategy sigma I for that player. Then we are going to choose a realization, not we, but nature, God, a mediator, someone is going to select a realization A according to the strategy profile. All other players follow sigma star. So this is the sigma star and the minus one, minus i for some reason here. And player i deviated to sigma i. So the adversary selected a player to deviate and the deviating strategy. And then, according to the new strategy profile, we select a realization. Nature selected a realization. This realization is told to the players. Now, the statistician, well, if the realization is in B, the statistician wins because we did not get out of the target set. If the set A is as if the sequence the realization a is outside b then the statistician is called to select a player j to blame if the, the statistician blames the correct player he wins and otherwise he loses okay. so this is our game so you see that this is a game with imperfect monitoring because the statistician does not see the moves, the selections of the adversary. All the statistician observes is the realization. Okay. But this is a game. Now, this is a game. Uh, now, we, uh, what we would like to show is that the statistician can always identify correctly the deviator, player I. Okay, so J is equal to I with high probability. So essentially what we would like to show is that the value of this game is high, is close to one. But this game has a value and it is close to one. Okay, that's our goal. And if we do that, then we prove the result. So first, the game has a value. Why does the game has a value? Well, since n is finite, the set of strategies of the statistician is finite because the set of the realizations is finite. So the strategy set of the statistician is finite. And in every one shot game in which one of the players has a finite set of actions, we have an the value exists. So therefore, the value of this game exists. And the intricate point is to show that the value is close to one. So uh, the min max value of this, uh, of this game is at least one minus the square root of i epsilon. This is the last step of the proof. So, um, what I'm going to show is that the min max value is at least one minus i i times the square root. So i is outside the square root, of not inside the square root. This simplifies the argument, uh, not by much, but anyway, it simplifies it. So we would like to show that the min max value of the game is at least something. Now, to calculate the min max value, what do we need to show? We need to show that for every selection of the adversary, the statistician has a response that is good. So we fix 
the, the moves of the adversary. So the adversary chooses for each player I a strategy, a possible strategy sigma I. This is a strategy of the adversary in the one shot game. A player and for, it, uh, and, uh, for the player, the strategy. Now, now we do have for each player I, we have the strategy and the, I mean the deviating strategy sigma I and the only strategy sigma star I. So we can calculate the likelihood ratio. So now we calculate for each player I the likelihood ratio of the his or her actions given sigma star, given the honest strategy, and given the deviating strategy. Okay. So what is the likelihood ratio of player I given a sequence of moves? So this is the product of all overall n stages. The probability that sigma I chooses the move AIN, this is in the denominator, and in the numerator, the same product, but relative to sigma I. So this ratio is the likelihood ratio of the actions of player I between the deviating strategy sigma I and the, uh, and the honest strategy sigma star of I. Now we can note that if we take this likelihood ratio and we multiply it by the probability that sigma star of sigma star of this A, we simply get the probability to get A under sigma star of minus I and sigma I. So for any sequence A, if we take the likelihood ratio, now what is the probability of sigma star under sigma star of A? This is simply the product of all the numerators, overall I. So if we take this product, the product for player I vanishes, disappears, cancels out, and we are left with this product for all players without player I in the numerator here times the numerator here, and therefore we get this problem. Similarly, if we take the, this probability of sigma star of an action profile, an action a, a realization times two likelihood ratios, we get another probability of A given another strategy profile. And now if we define E of J, ah, and now the statistician is going to blame that player that has the highest likelihood ratio, which is what we would like to do in the naive approach, to blame a player with high likelihood ratio. So EJ is the set of all realizations where the statistician blames player J. And this is a subset of the realization in which J is the player with maximum likelihood ratio because there might be real realizations where two players have the same maximum ratio. And then which uh, the statistician can blame only one thing. Okay. Now, what we know is that if all players are honest, then the probability that we blame, we blame player J is uh, smaller is smaller than the probability that we do not reach D that we blame anyone, which is at most epsilon. Okay. So this this was uh, our assumption that the probability that to reach the complement is small. And so now, um, so I will uh, I will uh, uh, move here quickly uh, by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We can prove that the probability of EJ when player I deviates is at most squared is at most epsilon. So by Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, the probability that if player I deviates, we actually blame player J is square root of epsilon, at most square root of epsilon. So the probability to, uh, to blame someone who is not player I is at most I minus one times the square root of epsilon. 
So uh, this, and this is the whole proof. Okay, so we prove that the min max value is at least one minus I minus one actually times square root of epsilon. Okay. So this is the proof of the theorem. We use the min max theorem to prove it. Sorry, I, I didn't find, understand one thing. So the sigma I itself is not known, isn't it? Because you don't know how they deviated. So I thought there would be an additional argument here that you estimate this with like the worst case. What did I, what did I overlook? No, so we calculate here the mean max the mean max value. To calculate the mean max value, what do we do? And since the value exists, we know that the value is equal to the mean max value. Now, to calculate the mean max value, what do we do? We say for every strategy of the adversary. Oh yeah, sure. All we right. need to show that we have a good response. So we know the deviation. Yes, yes. No, I mean you know oh, it. Yeah. You, you 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 know it, and then you can best respond this. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So the, the the trick here was to uh, define a game, an auxiliary game where the value exists, and then we don't need to calculate the value, but the min max value, and then we can calculate the likelihood ratio. Now you see that this is only an existence result. We know for every strategy of the adversary, we know what is our best response, but we don't, we don't know what is an epsilon optimal strategy of the statistician in this auxiliary game. And therefore we do not know what is a good blame function. So uh, most of my, uh, my comments, we already uh, discussed during uh, the talk. Uh, first, uh, this result can be used to prove existence of epsilon equilibrium in repeated games with pay measurable payoffs. Second, um, as I said, uh, it, is not, it will be interesting to know explicit blame functions in particular cases. Um, we, uh, I provided two uh, non-trivial blame functions, but in general, I don't know. Uh, it, it, might, it is interesting. Also, uh, I mentioned about the, the ratio, the square root of uh, epsilon, uh, whether we can improve it or not, and whether we can identify the best blame function that actually achieved the best possible uh, rate. What happens when more than one player is allowed to deviate? So we have ideas, but we don't have uh, any explicit uh, result about it, whether we can uh, identify deviations by more than one player. What we, can, what we do know is that suppose that five players deviated, then we have a blame function that blames five players, at least one of them will be guilty, but the other four may be innocent. Okay, so this is not what we want uh, to have. We would like to actually identify the five deviators. We are not there yet. Also, uh, what happens when actions are observed with some noise? Uh, we do not know whether we can extend our result to this model as well. Thank you very much. And if there are additional questions, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. I I have a few questions, but uh, first of all, let me use this opportunity to congratulate in this audience, Noga Alon, for being awarded the show prize. Okay. Thanks. Uh, now, I guess that the issue of uh, finding the, a blame function Yes, not just proving its existence, is a more general question about the uh, cases by which uh, one might know that uh, one has this, uh, this type of games, yes, it's called the Martin games, I don't know which name you want to say, that you know that there exists a, a winning strategy, but you don't know, uh, but you don't know how to compute it. So is it, 
is there an old class that we could identify when this is difficult, not difficult? Noga, maybe you know this. You are muted, Noga. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I, can you repeat it again? Uh, I, I, I say that there are uh, many Blackwell games, uh, uh, let's say Martin's games, even as. Uh, zero one that you know that you could prove that player one is a winning strategy, but uh, and you cannot construct a winning strategy. Right. So is there some? Uh, I would guess that probably the logicians have been uh, trying to uh, to trace to coin those type of uh, games. So, uh, so so is this a special case that you don't we don't know how to find it? Is it? an instance of one of these uh, general classes of games that the statisticians claim that you cannot compute. Maybe even there are results that you cannot compute an optimal strategy. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if there is a connection. So for example, there are these games that we know that some player is winning because of strategy stealing, but we don't know uh, an explicit strategy. But uh, uh, yeah, but but I don't know if there is any connection. Yes. Okay. And and another question, Elon, you mentioned. I I think maybe I already asked it at some point about the issue of a group of deviators. Mm -hmm. Yes. But uh, if you split the players into two different groups, yes, and only one of them uh, deviates, yes, so so can you not make various blame factions for various subgroups, assuming that you know that not all of them are deviating, at least one is honest. Can you generate many such blame functions and as a result of all of them, to identify the set of players that deviated. So suppose that some players may deviate, but we know that at least one of them did not deviate. So what you would like to do is you would like to uh, divide the players into a, a group of a single player and n minus one players. And the complement, yes. And the complement. And then to test whether... Um, the player deviated or the complement. Right. And you do it for all players, yes? Yeah. How, um, so for that you have a blame function. Yes. Right. Um, so basically you could know if there is. But suppose that you are one of the deviators. And now I consider the set that you deviate and also someone from the other, from your complement deviated. So now we are in the setup in which two, both players deviate, right? You and the rest, sort of as a single player, also deviate. I do not know whether we can now, do we have a blame function that identifies that, that the both players deviated? I don't know. But basically, if you know that one is not deviating, yes, then and you find that the complement is deviating, okay, so you could test basically, if I understand your result, you could test also if somebody didn't deviate it. And if yes. you make in parallel those tests on each one of the players, you know who are the deviators. Yeah, but suppose that you deviated and Noga deviated. Suppose. And they test you and your complement. Yes. And suppose that now you deviated, but also Noga deviated. So your complement also deviated. Suppose that my blame function tells me that the complement deviated and you didn't. Why? Because the complement deviated. So it identifies it. Okay. So do I announce you as an honest no, person? No, 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 no. You com you compute you. Com now you know that I didn't deviate it. Now you take groups. No, but you actually did deviate. That's the issue. You did deviate, Abraham. 
you deviate and Noga deviated. But when I test you against everyone else, then the test tells me that everyone else deviated. Someone from the else set deviated and you didn't deviate. Right, because our blame function only tell, only blames a single player. So it has to choose either you or the rest, because both of you okay. deviated, but it tells the, the rest deviated. So okay, it so tells me I that you didn't deviate. deviate. If I didn't deviate, you blame the rest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So assume that you discover that it deviated, and then you test the rest. Now you take me and Noga together against the rest. Mm -hmm. so if both of us didn't deviate, then you will blame the rest. No, so suppose that only you and Noga deviated. In that case, no, it, you, it, you already uh, discovered that I didn't deviate it by, by your first test. Yes, but you actually did deviate. But the point is that you did deviate. You deviated, Abraham. You and Noga deviated. Ah, so, so so you say if both have deviated, then it, you only require that you will blame one of them. Exactly. Then... We blame the one with the highest likelihood ratio. It happened to be the other guys, not you. The, the group that includes Noga. And suppose that indeed we, we do all the sub, subgroups and we find that Noga, will, Noga indeed deviated. So we blame only Noga and not you. But you actually deviated. Okay. So I do not know whether this can or cannot be done. I hope it can. Are there more questions? Well, if not, then we can carry on again. Thank you very much. Uh, so, sorry, Helen, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. So you, you, your proof that you fixed a uh, finite end. So, so, so your model, model actually, so the result is true for, for infinite games. So is there any gap in the proof or? So I, prove, I assumed that uh, n is finite so that I have easily that the game has a value. Yeah. Because when is, n, is, n is finite, the value exists. Yeah. Suppose what happens when n is infinite? Okay, so the problem is an infinite horizon problem. In that mm -hmm. case, it is not true. Uh, or I cannot uh, say easily that the game has a value. I yeah. have to work a little bit to prove that the game has a value. So what we do, we say, okay, so since the probability of D is at least one minus epsilon, uh, and since uh, all uh, probabilities over uh, the space A to the power infinity are regular, we can, appro we can approximate B from below by a closed set. So we can assume without loss of generality that the set D is closed. Now, if the set D is closed, then the payoff function in this game is upper semi-continuous. And okay. then we can apply a fixed point theorem for upper semi-continuous functions to show that the game has a value. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to work a little bit harder, but it's not really an issue, a problem. Okay, okay, I see, thank you. So, so a further question is, uh, suppose that game is actually finite, so is it easier to construct a blame function or not? I don't know. Uh, Noga, what do you think? I mean, the, the proof you described was for finite, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think there is a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So unfortunately, she or she, the answer is no. That we we are not aware of. Uh, but but you can you can you can maybe there is some algorithm for you to find the uh, optimal strategy in finite game that is easier. Yeah, if there is an algorithm, uh, to the I guess there are algorithms. 
uh, to find optimal strategies in, in zero sum games, right? We know there are such algorithms. The only problem is that the game is quite large, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, the set of, of uh, so if each player has two actions, then the set of strategy profiles in each stage is two to the power of the number of players. And then you have to take that to the power n to uh, okay. see the number of uh, realizations. So the game is quite large. So uh, to actually run those algorithms, this might be problematic. OK, I see. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, Hello, yeah. may I ask a question? Yes. So uh, first, I mean, thanks for the talk. Uh, so here, I think the result is mainly focusing on the probability of detection, right? Mm -hmm. So do you have any idea about the probability of false alarm? So we know that the, we assume that the probability if everyone is honest, of B mm -hmm. is at least one minus epsilon, uh -huh. which means that the if I understand you correctly, the probability of false alarm is at most epsilon, because the probability that if everyone is honest, nevertheless uh -huh. the realization is not in B, this is a false alarm. Then you would say, wow, someone deviated, and the probability of false alarm is at, low, at most epsilon. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. More questions? So thank you very much. And uh, Galit, we meet again in two weeks. We meet again, I don't know, let me check. So. I don't remember by hard the schedule. Mm. Hey, Leon, do you have a working paper? Yes, indeed. Yeah. No, I, we have no talk scheduled, in, uh, I think, until uh, next year. Okay. Now. So unless uh, somebody wants to present. <laughs> OK, uh, so we do have uh, a working paper. I can post it on the chat. Um, Thank you. Yeah, sure.